Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, Book of Matthew, where Christ is finishing up the Sermon on the Mount here. And it's very important that you pay close attention to it. He has given us the events that will transpire that consummate the end of this age. So you're not taken by surprise. You're not deceived. And um, he will continue on into the 25th chapter to conclude the uh, Sermon on the Mount. It, it is so wonderful that he spent the time and the simplicity in which he delivered it, this message concerning the end times. It leaves us without excuse as far as knowing what would happen. Now, uh, here as he concluded this, what would happen at the very end, who did he bless? Did he bless the first one that was taken in the field? No, they were taken by Antichrist. He blessed the one that stayed in the field working, allowing the Holy Spirit to work through them. Therefore, it alleviates any anxiety about the first taken and what was happening. Incidentally, it doesn't take a, a, a real bright person to know when he said it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah, that... Um, they're going to be deceived, those first taken, even by fallen angels, as they were in the day of Noah, when they, rather than being born to woman, wanted to seduce women. So uh, always remember that. And, and you'll remember what it said in verse 46. We're going to pick it up in verse 47, but I want you to well remember who's blessed. Not the first one taken, but who? Verse 46 read, Blessed is that servant who his Lord, when he cometh, finds so doing. That means still working in God's vineyard, doing Christ's work, not being deceived by some false Messiah or some false prophet. You stick to the word the way it was written to you. Do not let man deceive you and be blessed. Because how blessed are they? We pick it up with verse 47. It tells us as we get a word of wisdom from our Father. Verse 47, Matthew 24 reads, Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him, that's the one that stays working in the field, ruler over all his goods. That's during the millennium. They're going to reign and rule and teach with the Lord Jesus Christ as it is written in Revelation chapter 20, verse 6 for a thousand years. Don't be the first one taken from that field. They're taken by the false Messiah. Verse 48. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. It's been like this since the beginning of time. It's not going to happen. You don't have to worry about it. Just keep on plugging like you always have. Enjoy the world and forget about God. You don't ever go there, especially when you see the signs he forewarned you about transforming and happening right before our very eyes, benchmark after benchmark after benchmark. Verse 49, And shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. Well, now, now who, who is this eat and drink with the drunken? Well, he told you, in 38, verse 38, have you so soon forgotten? Let's read it. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, not waiting for the marriage supper of the Lamb, but giving in marriage to the false Messiah until the day that Noah entered into the ark. It's going to be just like that again. That's who those wicked, evil servants that did not study God's Word and are taken in by the spurious Messiah when He shows up on earth first 
at the sixth trump, the true Christ not coming until the seventh. Don't you dare sup with them. You remain, be blessed by working in the field. Do not be deceived. Verse 50, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. Do you know why he'll miss the day and the hour? Do you know why he is so susceptible to being deceived? Because he thinks Christ is already here. He thinks he's been blessed and ha everything's going his way. And then to wake up and realize that he's worshiping Satan, the old devil himself, wanted to be a Christian all their life, played to be, prayed to be saved and baptized but never got around to studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, to read this Sermon on the Mount, to know absolute documentation and proof of exactly what consummates the end of this age. What is the day and what is that hour? It's the hour of temptation. When you do a little homework, you find out that that one hour is symbolic of a five-month period from Revelation chapter 17, where Satan through his full time is called the hour of temptation. And then you learn in Revelation chapter 9 that, um, that all this has been shortened to a five-month period, which means what? What's half an hour? As it reads in Revelation chapter 8 verse 1, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Two and a half months. You, you escape the hour of temptation for a very simple reason. You do not find Satan tempting. You do not find the false Messiah tempting as he deceives our people that you tried to help, that you tried to warn. And they jump right into him, leading, following his lead, guiding him, all happy thinking the true Christ is returned. Be that good servant that keeps working in the field and let Christ utilize you in bringing in the kingdom. Therefore, you're a part of that kingdom. Verse 51, And shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, the play actors. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And certainly it is. The, who are these play actors? That's the Kenites. How would you like to be lumped with them? that really hate our Father and His way. That's what happens to those that are deceived by Him. Uh, is it not true that we have a wedding coming? Spiritually speaking now, come with me spiritually, and you're supposed to be a spiritual virgin up at the time of that wedding. That's why He told you in this chapter, woe to those that are with child. He did not mean a woman that had an actual babe in her womb, uh, with conception. He meant those that are spiritually impregnated with the false teachings of the, the false Messiah and wed him out of season, thinking he is the Christ, and they are no longer virgins. That's I'm trying to explain the gnashing of teeth. They're good people. They truly love the Lord. They just wouldn't listen and were not taught that the false one comes first. Therefore, they're no longer virgins and they wake up, good Christian people, to realize this wasn't Christ that came giving gifts to everyone. It was the devil. And instead of being Christians, they're devil worshipers. And God cast them aside. And they were so ashamed to even face Christ that they gnash their teeth and pray for mountains to fall on them as it's written in Revelation chapter 9. You know, that's going to hurt real bad, and it doesn't give me certainly any pleasure that that's going to happen, but it will. So all we can do is do our best to warn, to teach, and to prepare. Chapter 25, this, this, can, this will kind of conclude or bring to a close the Sermon on the Mount, but it's very important. Let's go into it. Verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, uh, these naturally would all be Christian, and, and they're all virgins. 
They've stayed true to the Lord up to a certain point. And, uh, and, and so it is, verse two. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. You do not want to fall in that foolish category. Verse three. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. They had no reservoir. Now, what does, what does, um, what is this word oil as it is uh, used here? It is elion. And do you know what tree it comes from? That's olive. And do you know what the tree it comes from is called? Elia, the sacred name of the living God. It is God's truth that you put in your lamp and your lamp does what? It gives light. It gives truth whereby people can, can see that light and not the darkness that Satan brings upon this world. And through that light can be a blessing to others. So uh, the very name of the oil itself, even in the Greek tongue, Elayon, Elayah produces that oil. And naturally, God himself produces that oil, which is the truth that will light your lamp, whereby it's a blessing to all that come into that light that have eyes to see and ears to hear. But, um, they, they were Christian, but they never really studied God's word to absorb the truth, the full truth, like the Sermon on the Mount here, had no conception whatsoever. They were just ready to fly away. They got work to do, the one that wants to be blessed. Don't be that one taken by Satan. Next verse to continue. Verse four. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They not only had their lamp full, but they had a reservoir of truth. And to make that light last through whatever time it was, through whatever hardship, you know, and when you absorb God's truth and have your reservoir of knowledge filled, whereby you can confront anything Satan might throw at you, you do not find him tempting. Therefore, you escape totally the hour of temptation. Do you, know, do you know how some would-be so-called uh, scholars, teachers, say the hour of temptation, escaping it means? You're going to fly away. That's false teaching. God's blessed stay working in this field, not deceived, not being the first one taken by the spurious Messiah. Extremely important. Make certain that you absorb the knowledge and the wisdom that God gives you in the simplicity in which Christ teaches. In other words, what I'm saying, it's not complicated. It flows like the very oil itself of the olive into the buds of your mind and enlightens you. Verse five, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. You know, that's a little wait here. People get uh, bored and people go to sleep. When you're a watchman, you watch. Do not go to sleep on watch. That has nothing to do with physical sleep. We're talking about spiritual sleep here. Don't let anyone lull you spiritually asleep. You stay sharp and you stay alert. You keep the oil in your lamp. Verse six. And at midnight, this is to let you know we're at the end. There was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. In other words, this is the end of the age. This is what we've all waited for. Well, now, wait a minute. What about these that were deceived by Satan and have fallen in the sack with him? Now, there are the five foolish and plus many others to go with it. You don't want to go there. That's why there's gnashing of teeth. They're too ashamed to face the true Christ. They consider themselves not worthy. You are worthy when you fill your lamp with the oil of our people. That is the truth of God. And you follow him and obey him. Verse seven, 
Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. This is to make them burn brighter. You trim that little wick and whoop, it just comes right up there and gives a much brighter light. How bright is your light? Do you know how to trim it? And do you know how to really put forth the Word of God or even to let the, your eyes shine forth with the, with the presence of the Holy Spirit that it touches people? It's so precious that you do, that you have that oil and that you do trim those wicks where you're sharp and you're ready. Verse 8, And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Now, when you're already at the twelfth hour, if you waited that long, it's a little late to learn all the, a lot of the truth of God's Word, which, even though it's very simple, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seven events that consummate the end of this age, seven seals, seven trumps, seven vials, their chronological order as they fall. It's real simple to understand them when you make a study of the book of Revelation. You won't be deceived, and you will have that oil, that truth in your forehead, whereby nobody's going to tempt you. The hour of temptation will not bother you rather than finding him tempting, you find him to be an abomination. Yep, their, their, um, their lamps had gone out, which means what? They had no truth. They were just talk, they talked about Christianity. Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality. Verse 9, But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Get in there and dig it out. Handle it for yourself. Um, and, and, and that's okay. If anybody wants to wait till the 12th hour, you know, this kind of lets you know what happens in the 11th hour. That means right before his return. Let it sink well into your mind, okay? It's just before the appearance at the seventh trump. Verse 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. They knew they had to have that light to make it. They had to have those lamps to make it where they would be of that bridegroom. But when he came and they were ready, and they were ready, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So five went in, five were ready, the door was shut. Where does that leave the five out chasing around in the boonies? Verse 11, afterward came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Verse 12, and he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now, in other places in the Word, it gives this where they come and they say, Oh, Jesus, we're so glad you're back. We've healed in your name. We've cast out demons. And he told them, You get out of my sight. I never knew you. Why? Because they were depending on the false Messiah. They had already accepted him. He had had his way with them spiritually. And they want to finally say, Jesus, I love you, when they're devil worshipers? Now think about that a minute. Christ wants you to know that he has feelings. And when you go worshiping another Messiah, he's jealous. This is why it's stated back in this particular chapter before this, 24, Woe to those that are with child when I return and give suck. That means not a physical mother with a child in her womb, but somebody that is spiritually impregnated with the false Christ and is even nursing along his ministry. I want to do a little job for the church here, only it's Satan's church. And they come rushing up and want Christ to receive them? Tough luck. You know, he sent the letter, 
He sent the Sermon on the Mount where you had every opportunity to know and understand God's Word and the truth if you would just take the time. Well, I'm a little busy in the world. Well, hey, have a good trip. You better enjoy it. It might be the end for you. Because Christ said, I know ye not. That means you didn't make it. Verse 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now, the wise understand the season. He gave us that in the parable of the fig tree. And certainly um, uh, how, how precious it is that in knowing the season, you are prepared to carry forth the torch in your lamp. you got enough oil to be a torch, not just a lamp. And you let it burn because you're well equipped against those that will just really, uh, you know, it, it's really a shame. And I, I, I know I harp on this somewhat, but it's, it means souls are at risk. When, when you will believe a preacher and allow him to say, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to be gone. You would let a man tell you you didn't have to understand God's Word. Boy, you would be easy, easy bait for Satan. If you would listen to a man and bet your living soul, eternal soul, upon that, you can be had real easy want to get it from God's Word. Don't listen to this man or any other man without checking them out chapter by chapter, verse by verse. You can cut it. You can do it. You know the season. Be prepared. How do I fill my lamp? The oil is truth from God. You get that from His Word. Verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. This is, how, this is how it is, the king and his dominion, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. He put them responsible for all of it. Now, you know, that puts a little bit of a load on God's elect. He, he expects he, you're responsible. Okay. I, I don't want anyone to let that be a burden. It's a delight. It's a pleasure. Verse 15, And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Listen carefully. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. In other words, God never gives you more than you can handle. And he understands that he can give some more than others. But that doesn't make anyone, he's not a respecter of persons. It doesn't make anyone any more important than anyone else. For a, a very simple reason. <clears throat> that Those he gives much, he expects much. Those he gives little, he expects little. But he does expect produce, productivity. Verse 16. Then he that received the five talents went and traded. He occupied with the same. He, he, he had the word, okay? And made them other five talents. He brought them in. Now, that's 100%. Got 10 talents now. Verse 17. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained another two. How much is that? That's 100%. That's the way God looks at it. Okay. One's got 10 and the other's got 4, and God calls them both 100%. 18. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Took what little truth he had and just snuffed it away. Wouldn't live it, didn't bother it, wouldn't touch it. 19. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth uh, with them. In other words, it's payday. It's time to <coughs> bring up everything. Get, let's get the, everything squared away. Verse 20. And so he that had received five talents came 
and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. That's a, a hundred percent. Okay. Done good. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. The joy of the Lord is a wonderful thing. You enter into it by serving him, by being accountable and, and producing. He, he gained 100%. Now watch his words here, 22. He that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents besides them. I've got four. That's 100% any way you slice it. Okay. Listen to what the Father says, 23. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. They received the same reward. One had ten, one had four. Still the same with the Lord. That's what he held them accountable for because he knew that's what they could handle. God will never give you more than you can handle. That's why you hear me quote 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 so much. Nothing's going to happen to you that doesn't pretty well happen to everybody. God will never tempt you over what you can handle, and He will always show you a way out. You want to believe that with all your heart, your soul, body, and mind. Father takes care of His own. He's not a, respect, a respecter of person. He didn't love the one that brought in ten talents any more than He did the four. It was both 100% with the, our Heavenly Father. Uh, you might say, well, how, how can you figure that? Because God gave them the fruit to start with. Okay. They didn't do it. The one that had five, he didn't make those five. God gave it to them. It's God's gifts. So God gives gifts, and he expects uh, likeness. Uh, not a respecter of person, but he knows who can cut it and, and what he can expect. 24. Then... He which had received the one talent came, and he said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. I knew that, 25. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. And lo, there... There thou hast, that is thine. He returned that one penny, one talent. How much, what a percentage is that? Zero. He didn't do anything. Where do you think that leaves him? 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful, that means lazy, servant. Thou knewest that I reap where I strawed, sowed not, and gathered where I have not strawed. Uh, in other words, uh, he expects his servants to produce. When he fed the multitude, when Christ fed the multitude, did he feed them? No, he did not. He blessed the bread and the fish, and he gave it to the disciples, and they did the feeding. He expects something from us. He expects action. And, and I don't want to put anybody on guilt trips. Our main time is yet to come to witness against the false Messiah. Don't, don't get your hornets all bunched up here, all right? We got work to do. Keep working. Stay in the field. Gain knowledge. That fills your old oil up right up to the top and in your reservoir as well, whereby you are ready. But here this poor, miserable, lazy soul returns to the Father what he gave him, and God counts it zero. Verse 27, Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. A, 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 a little bit of instruction, something. Some, 
But um, it would have been better for you to have done something. But he did nothing. That, there's a good lesson within that. God will, uh, it, it, and it should be a comfort to people that feel inadequate. Because God always gives you what he's happy with, what he knows you can handle. And as I said, the main time is coming when God's elect must witness against the false one. That's our main number one purpose is to have those lamps full, the reservoir full of truth to share and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us. But when you draw back, and what, what was the one word he said that is so common with man if you're not careful? Fear, I was afraid. How can you love Almighty God and know that he created every star in the heavens, every planet, every planet, he created this earth in all its beauty and splendor. And all the souls that you see walking on this earth, God created them. And he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And you're afraid? There's nothing to be afraid of. He's on the throne. He controls. He will never give you more than you can handle, and he will always show you a way out. So to fear is to doubt every promise of God. Don't go there. Not healthy, not wise. Serve the living God. You know, uh, and many, many will, I, I, I worry about putting people on guilt trips and they, well, I've got to go print some tracks and start passing them out or something. No, that, that's not what he's talking about. You follow his word here. He's let you know that some are going to be delivered up the, of God's elect, and that's the main thing. Number one is that you don't let him down in that respect. But from some people, he gives a beautiful smile. And that smile is priceless in its effect upon people. A wholesome Christian smile that just makes people in the room feel better. Why? Because it's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's very real. You know, we're not playing church. Christianity is a reality. And this word is very real. So. That poor person that was afraid, he let his life just slip right on away from him as far as rewards are concerned. Verse 28, take therefore the talent from him, God says, uh, Christ says, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. He knows how to handle it. 29, for unto every one that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. That's pretty plain. You know, God gives us a mind and a body and a soul. He owns all souls. Have you ever read Ezekiel 18, 4? Don't think you're going to get around to giving your soul to God. He owns it. All souls belong to God. That's what it says in Ezekiel 18, 4. Serve him. Love him. That's the main thing he wants is your love. And then he will direct you as to what he expects from you. Verse 30, and what does he do to this poor, frightened creature? 30, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what it leads up to. When, when, you, um, when, when, when somebody really wants to serve and means well, they just can't quite make muster and are deceived and disappointed because they wanted to make the eternity and thank God for the millennium. Uh, who knows what, it, uh, what we can do about the gnashing teeth there by letting people know that God wants their love. Verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, hey, that's what you're looking for, friend, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Uh, he's going to do that. Christ is going to establish his kingdom right here on earth. Uh, well, where does it say that? Ezekiel chapter 16, Revelation chapter 21 and 2. 
verse 32, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Now, uh, God uh, has children all over this world. He created them the way they are. He has nations all over this world. He chose the nation, Israel, that is to say the house of the ten tribes, and the house of Judah being a, a separate nation. Uh, but he has work for them. But he does love all his children. Here's the qualification, that love him. You want me to repeat it again? That love him. If you don't love him, I'm sorry, you're, you're in a heap of hurt. And, and he even knows what you're thinking, so you can't con him. Okay, You don't play games with him. That's why he can take that shepherd's rod, and I mean separate the good from the bad or the nations one from the other. And next verse, please, verse um, 33. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Always go to the right. Always do what's right. Always think right. When you see people going left, usually they want to leave God out of the formula, God out of the equation. And unfortunately, you lead from, from thinking left to socialism and then into communism. And all you have to do is look at the nations he's separating and see who's blessed. Okay. And, you know, a, a wise person can understand pretty quick who's blessed and who isn't. Doesn't take long when you look at the history of the world. Verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That means from the very beginning in the first earth age, it was prepared, it was declared, it was part of God's uh, word of salvation, his plan of salvation to bring it into being. Always fish out of the right side of the boat. That is not political, that's common sense. If you want blessings, if you don't, hey, have a good trip, it's okay with me. I could care less. If anyone wants to choose that path, hey, have to it. But if you want eternal life, you will choose the right. It is the only way to go, to have eternal life. If you don't want eternal life, that's fine with me. Why? We don't want anybody there upsetting or thinking they know something that, uh, that is not of God's Word. We only want people in heaven that have earned it. That's what this is all about. How are you doing? You love him? Then let him know you want, that you do love him, okay? Let him know what is right. You find out what is right by his word, it is right. It is truth. All right, bless your heart. You listen in a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. There we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We do not judge people. 
But you don't have to. God does, okay? He is our judge. But you do have the right for spiritual discernment to know truth when you hear it and fiction when you hear it. Do you know how weighty that is? Your eternal soul depends on it. It's a gift from God, spiritual discernment is. Don't ever let anyone deceive you. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure hearing from you. Now, you got a prayer request. You don't need the number. We can do away with that. We can do away with the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He does. He created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. Your fingerprints are different. You're unique. That's why God wanted someone just like you. But he wants you to love him. And by doing that, you make his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. Let him know that you love him. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. We're going to go with David from Michigan. Uh, when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments and, and uh, Aaron was in charge, why did the people start worshiping a calf of all things? Was it an Egyptian god? Well, in Egypt, there was a god on every corner. Well, whatever it was, it could be a god of this or a god of that. So it kind of did set the stage for that. They, they were just bored. I mean, 40 days, they had seen the Red Sea parted. They had seen the marvels and wonders that Moses had, God had developed through Moses of, uh, of uh, bringing the Egyptians to their knees to release them. And yet 40 being, in biblical numerics, probation. They couldn't handle the probation. And, and uh, many of them, it was the gold in the calf they were worshiping, not necessarily the calf. Sally from Arizona. Uh, I, uh, I, it's been a few months since I've written to you. I have to look in the dictionary to make sure I spell my word right. I only have a sixth grade education. I can read okay, just can't spell too good, and I have not heard you answer any of my letters. I know that you can not answer every one letter, but that's okay. I still love you. Well, I, well thank you. I return that love. And, and your staff. I am a 62-year-old woman, and I live on a fixed income of a certain amount. I'm not going to read it. I know you do not ask for money, and we don't. We're not beggars. But I try to send, well, thank you, bless you. I'm going to try to get to your question here. So much that I think out of seven years, I have missed about five of your teachings. Well, you're a faithful student of God's Word, and um, I think you write real good whether you use the dictionary or not, and we will pray for you, and you're in good shape. Thank you for writing. You did a good job. Um, now, uh, John from Ohio. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, yeah, from Ohio. Um, this says Con Connecticut, I think. Okay, well, whichever. Ohio. Oh, it's a town in Ohio. I gotcha. I met my wife, Sharon, at the age of 21, and I was 41. We were, we've been together for 25 years, and she passed suddenly March the 15th of 2012 at the age of 46. She did not have a chance to repent that day. Will God have mercy on her soul? You know, you don't know whether she did or not. It only takes a flash. And I'm sure she was a good woman because she loved you. And I, don't, don't worry about it. Leave that part to God. She's in good hands. She's with him. Um, and will I see her again? And I read in the Companion Bible every day with you, and it changes my life for the good, thanks to the Father. Well, we're sorry about your loss. And uh, don't you, you know, naturally, that's like losing half of yourself. But she is with the Father, and she's doing fine, and, um, and probably is really pulling for you, and looks like you're doing good, too. God bless you. You're all right. You will see her again. You, can, you read the Companion Bible. Read 
uh, Ezekiel chapter 44, beginning with about verse 20. And it documents that we will recognize our loved ones there, family. Wanda from Florida. Thank you for your compliment uh, on the teaching. Um, and, um, and glad you've learned more than in your church for many years. I fell, I, fell, I fell and broke my hip and was in the hospital for a month and six days. My friend told them but no one person came to see about me. Well, it's been over two years since I've been to church. Well, the church sent me a letter that said I owed a, over a year's in tithing. I'm on SS and SSI, and I don't know what to do, so I don't go to that church. You, they should never do that, okay? God doesn't send out beggars. Maybe, maybe you're better off not going there. In my heart and mind, I belong to your church. God's word, um, uh, it's uh, okay. I watch you every week. Uh, that, well, thank you for being with us, and you are in church, and, and I, I'm sorry. Forgive them, and just don't, don't worry about sending them anything. You haven't been there. They haven't taught you anything. You don't owe them anything. You tithe where you are fed God's word. If it isn't God's word, you don't tithe God's money there, okay? And, and, and God doesn't send out beggars. So when they write you a letter begging, tear it up and throw it in the garbage. I, I, I know I make a lot of points and friends among ministries, but, and, uh, but, but I teach God's word. And if they, would do, if they would teach it and do it God's way, they would never have to beg because God brings blessings. So, uh, I don't know. Maybe someday they'll catch on. Shirley from Texas. My husband and I enjoy you every day. Thank you. My question is, will there be animal sacrifices in heaven? Absolutely not. Okay. Read Hebrews chapter 10 in the New Testament. When Christ died on the cross, that ended any blood sacrifice forever. All the blood rituals... And any ordinance that has to do with blood was nailed to the cross. And it would be sacrilegious to even think about blood sacrifices. I know it states this, but what is sacrificed in the millennium is love. Love to the Father. He expects it. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6 will answer your question. I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your love. Uh... Pastor Arnold Murray, my name is Mark from New York. I'm 12 years old. I have a question. My parents love me uh, and, um, and adore me. Uh, they are good to me, but I'm mean to them. I'm mouthy to them and disrespectful. I don't want to be mean. What should I do because I don't want to be like this, and would you and all of yours please pray for me? Well, we'll sure do it, but we're going to do more than that, okay? I'm going to tell you to get cracking, all right? You, you proved to me that you're at the age of accountability because you know better. And when you know better, you should act better. The old devil is going to take you away, boy. And I'm not trying to frighten you. I'm just saying you're eating right out of his hands. you got good parents that God sent you. One of the commandments is honor your mother and father. Because of them, we got you. And I, I, think, I think you're all right because you're, you're, you can face up and you want to do what's right. So we're going to be praying for you. I want you to write me again and I want to hear how good you've been to your mom and dad. Okay, You love them because they love you. I want to hear it. I'm going to give you two weeks. <clears throat> okay, Hester, Hector from Indiana. I lost my wife to cancer five months ago. We've been together for 39 years, married for 34, but of us have both of us have been with each other since we met. My question is, do I or should I go out and meet other women and start over? I feel at my age I should not. Besides, I also feel 
she is watching me and we never fell out of love or divorce. That's beautiful, okay? We are separated by God for just a season. She was a, a caregiver and, I, and one of the nicest persons you would know. I feel if I did go out with someone that I am cheating on her. Well, you wouldn't have to feel that way because she loves you, but you're the one that has to decide that, okay? But uh, what, a, what a precious thought. You know that she is with the Father and that you will be back with her again. And, uh, and so it is. Not, not as man and wife, so you can just tuck that away and forget it, but as, as um, caregiver and being together and loving each other, you betcha. Okay, uh, this would be um, Richard from Connecticut. Um, and thank you for your comments. I'm, I'm Richard says he's been, uh, that, well, thank you for the compliment. I'm not going to read it. I, I'm 92 years old, he says, a World War II veteran on B-26 bombers. Salute, all right. Soloed my first airplane on May the 11th, 1944. You soloed just a short time before I did, so we're right in the same boat here. Have had two bouts with colon cancer and a stroke. I need to to see things written down. I'm interested in the end time uh, events. Do you have any books, papers, or graphs that show the sequence of the end time events? I have some others, but I don't dare to trust them uh, for accuracy. You say the Antichrist Satan comes out of the sixth. You, you got it. And I, I, you have my work, you can get my work on the book of Revelation and it will help you with that event. And congratulations, old B-26 was a good one and, um, and thanks for your service. Uh, Betty from, Flor from Florida, I believe that is, uh, I would like to know after we are changed into spiritual bodies, will we still go and be... Um, uh, guided by the book of life and return with the Father. His word, remember in the last lecture, his word never changes. That's why you never waste your time studying God's word. It's the same yesterday, it is today, and it'll be forever. Times will change, but God's word never changes. You know, that, that's, it is such a comfort to know you can count on his word just like this gentleman just before there that said he wanted me to outlay that because he trusted me. But why? Because I teach the word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Okay. So, and so it is that uh, you want to absorb that word. I mean, put it on, wear it. It's good for you. Uh, Gloria from North Carolina, please explain Second Peter chapter 3. Whoa, that's quite a long chapter. To summarize it quickly, he said, I've told you everything through the prophets and the apostles. That means both Old and New Testament. And he wanted you to be aware of there'll be some, in the end times, there would be people that'll come along and say, it's not going to happen. It's going to keep going like it is. Don't believe him, he said, because I destroyed the first earth age with water. It wasn't Noah's flood. It was the Kutabo. <clears throat> and he said, I'm going to destroy this earth age. That is to say, the rudiments, the elements, that's the bad stuff with fire. Not you. We don't have to worry about it. He's not angry at us. And then he said, I'm going to bring in the third earth age, and it's going to be forever. That's a, a fantastic book, the Second Peter chapter 3 especially. Nathan from Georgia. Uh, let's see it. Pa Pastor, I was wanting, could you give me some advice on uh, so that uh, what I shall do, thanks. Let's see, well, what is it you've got problems um, to me for your teaching? One of the things going on, a good, um, I watched the program, it makes me feel good. Well, that, that's good. Just, just stay in God's Word. And uh, it'll bring you peace of mind and give you direction. You, you stay in the Word. You don't, you know, it's everything. Our Father is everything. Don't let anyone take that away from you. Uh, this would be Alberta from Missouri. 
I want to thank you for your teaching. You're welcome. I'm disabled and I don't get out to church. I listen to you daily. I agree with most of what you say. Question, you read the King James Bible the same as I read. Why do you say the Holy Spirit when the word says Holy Ghost? <clears throat> I think about that a minute. What is the word in the Greek? It's pneuma. Well, what is pneuma? Well, what kind of tire, what kind of tires do you have on your car? Pneumatic it means it's air. Okay. The spirit in the Old Testament is called ruach, which is what wind, air. Okay. Why? Because you can't see it, you can't feel it. And, but I, as a student of God's word and and um, a worker in the languages. I am not going to call God a spook, okay? not from the word pneuma. He's not a ghost. He's not a spook. He's very real and he's with us every day and to, uh, the Holy Spirit is, is, is signified by a dove and a dove is no spook. So don't let somebody, uh, you know, whatever everyone's choice, but that's mine and I'm, I'm very bold about it. That's the way I like it. And that's the way it is. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, makes His day. And when you, and I'm talking to you now, when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. You can count on it. Why? He loves you. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, and only if we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. But most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.